Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece again from Central New Mexico Community College. So in video C, we're going to focus on terminology that helps us communicate about our patients. By that I mean it's very important that uh, you and your colleague can communicate about a patient's condition uh, properly and not get confused. And not just with your colleague, but with uh, an MD who works in the same hospital or even in a hospital that is in a, in a different location, such as in a different country, a different continent. So the terminology that we're going to learn is actually terminology that is um, used across the nation and across the world, maybe slightly different in a different language. But the point is that we tend to use very standardized terminology in order to ensure that communication about patients is going to be accurate and therefore information about our patient's conditions and ailments and, and pains, et cetera, are not lost um, as we communicate with the next person. For us to really be able to move on with studying the organ systems, there's quite a few things that we must do before we get to that point. For one, we really need to get more acquainted with anatomical terminology and learn how organs are organized in the body. And that then will wrap up this particular video. After that, we're going to study histology. We really need to have a better understanding of how organs are built with the help of tissues, which is the st when we study tissues, we're talking about histology. Not until then can we have um, not until then do we have the basic information or the foundation, I should say, to be able to grasp what the functions are of the organ systems and also their anatomy. So here we see um, an, a, a very typical image or images, I should say, that we see in every anatomy and physiology book's first chapter, and that is all the different uh, regions labeled on the body on the anterior side as well as the posterior side which you could call the ventral side and the dorsal side as well. It's important that you study these terms you just sit down and memorize them you cover them up and you just drill 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 drill. Make sure that you can go in both directions you can cover up the terms and try to remember what they are but you should also be able to go the other way. For instance, if I say, what is the axillary region? You should be able to say, oh, that is the armpit region, for instance. So this is something you'll have to do on your own. I'm not going to go over all these terms, but one thing that is very important is for you to recognize the positioning of this figure. Notice that this person has his feet pointing forward, but slightly spread apart just ever so slightly, so the limbs, the lower limbs are slightly spread apart, but the, the feet are pointing forward. Notice that the upper limbs are also slightly away from the body and that the palms are facing forward. And the face is facing forward. This is what we refer to as the anatomical position. This is a position that is accepted worldwide. Doesn't matter where you are, China, the, the United States, Europe, in the middle of nowhere in, in Africa, the anatomical position is accepted all over the world. And the, reason, re, the main reason for this is so that we can communicate with one another no matter what language we speak. And therefore, in every country, this would be the right arm. Notice that right and left is in reference to your patient or in reference to this, this uh, man that we see on this image. It's not your right, it is the patient's right. So that's the right arm, this would be the left arm. You will very quickly pick up on how important it is for you to understand this anatomical position particularly when you are taking the lab with this class or later on when you're really starting to take care of your patients and you need to convey 
to your colleagues or to doctors what exactly is going on with your patient, where they're hurting or where there is an injury or where they were given an injection, etc., etc. Another important area in anatomy is body planes. You're going to be looking at a lot of images and it's going to be important for you to get a good grasp of how these images or what these images are reflecting from what angle, from what kind of a body plane. So here, if we use this figure, the transverse plane creates a transverse cut, sometimes called a cross cut as well. And this is literally, you know, cutting a person in half, uh, which would happen, for instance, in, you know, if we look at a magician, a magician cuts his, his assistant in half. But we can have this transverse plane anywhere. We can have a transverse plane of the brain, for instance. It doesn't have to be the whole body. It could be a particular organ, even a... a, a a um, particular part of an organ. The frontal plane runs as follows and it means that um, if I were standing in front of you facing you uh, we would perhaps cut my whole body to where the front of my body would fall forward and the back of my body would fall backward. And again we can make these kinds of cuts per organ as well. So we refer to that as a frontal or coronal plane. And for those of you who speak Spanish, corona means crown. And so it makes sense that we refer to this as a, uh, a plane that follows the shape of a crown on a person's head. Finally, the sagittal plane is going to cut a person such that it creates two halves. So this would be one half created and this would be the other half. So we cut right through the midline of the person to create a what is called a mid-sagittal cut. So it would be more accurate to call this a mid-sagittal cut on this diagram. If we made the cut away from the midline, let's say we made the cut right here, we would refer to this as a parasagittal cut. So you might see that term as well. I'm going to abbreviate that. So it doesn't always have to go right through the middle of the body or even an organ. Finally, the oblique cut, which is not illustrated here, would be a cut that runs at an angle. So for instance, like so, this would be an oblique cut. We can't really communicate to one another, to our colleagues, to doctors, etc., where a patient is having pain or issues unless we also understand directional terminology. I've mentioned before that we can refer to the anterior side of a person as ventral as well. The back side of a person we refer to as posterior or we can call it dorsal. Anything that is to the side of something else, we say sits lateral. So we can say in this scenario, for instance, that the eyes sit lateral to our nose or the ears sit lateral to our nose. Or you can even go with one ear. So one ear sits lateral to the nose or the mouth. One breast sits lateral to the heart and vice versa the heart sits medial to the breast, or the heart sits medial to a lung. The thumb sits lateral to the other fingers, or the fingers sit, which we better refer to as the digit, digits or phalanges, sit medial to the thumb. Remember, you always have to look at a person in anatomical position to come up with this terminology. So you cannot just stand whichever way and go and turn your palms backwards and say, well, isn't my thumb now medial to my digits? No, you always have to imagine a person or yourself in this anatomical position. We're going to skip proximal and distal for a second and go to superior and inferior because they're a little easier to understand. Clearly, the head sits superior to the trunk of the body. The trunk is inferior to the head. And you can use the terms cephalad for superior and caudal, which means towards the tail, for inferior. Superficial versus deep. 
A good example would be that our skin sits superficial to, let's say, our muscles. Therefore, our muscles sit deep to our skin. So what about proximal versus distal? Those are a little bit more challenging to understand. Proximal and distal are two terms used in reference to the trunk of the body. Now, like the other terms, it's always proper to use these terms by comparing structures. For instance, before we continue with proximal and distal, you can't just say, oh, the ear, um, the ear sits lateral. Well, yeah, it sits lateral to the eye, as well as the nose and the mouth, which means, therefore, that the eye sits medial to the ear, right? No big deal. But if we look at the eye compared to the nose, the eye sits lateral to the nose. Again, you can't just say that a structure sits lateral. You need to compare it to something else, or medial for that matter. So let's go to proximal and distal. And let's pick two regions of the body. So let's pick the carpal area, which is your wrist area. Let's mark it like so. And compare it to the antecubital area, which is this area, the inside of your elbow here on the anterior side. Ask yourself, which one of these two structures is the closest to the trunk? Clearly, this one is, which is the antecubital area. And therefore, we say that the antecubital area sits proximal to the carpal area. The antecubital area sits proximal to the, cube, to the, palmar, to the cal, carpal area. Or vice versa. You can say that the carpal area sits distal to the antecubital area. Similar principle here, if we compare, let's say, the patellar area with the tarsal area, which is your ankle, you would say that the patellar, patellar area sits proximal to the tarsal area and vice versa. The tarsal area sits distal to the patellar area.